and yeah so and and he he will speak on questions of uh, murti and uh, it's the applications to set theoretic complete intersection curves so uh, i i welcome professor mohan kumar and thank him uh, for uh, volunteering to give this talk so you may please start thank you thank you jugal and thank you for organizing this very nice meeting in the lockdown days to keep us all motivated in some level or the other thank you so and uh, to the to the audience thank you for attending this and at the same time ask any questions that you want to ask and i will try to answer to the very best i can do and we are remember we are talking about stuff which are really pretty you know several decades old and uh, and there are still a few things which are left undone uh, so i will talk about some of those things today thank you all right so let's first uh, as usual fix some notations and convention as you can see i don't want to deal with anything non commutative and non mycelian so that's the first thing and the letter k will always you know the field and most of the time the uh, arguments can be you know i'll do think of them as algebraically closed field but often it is not necessary and for a for a finitely generated module m over a, any given ring the symbol mu is usually used to denote the number of minimal number of generators of this particular model and similarly for an ideal we have this extra notation mu subscript s of the ideal i which is to denote the smallest number of generators required to generate i up to radical that means i want an ideal j who has a certain number of it, number of generators and radical of j is equal to i and i want to find the smallest such number and it usually sometimes it's also called the arithmetic rank of the ideal i and as usual of course we write vi for a symbol if an ideal is given then vi is a subset of the spectrum of r uh, the set of primes containing i which is standard and similarly the next notation is even more standard for any element in uh, h and r we write r subset h to denote the localization of r as the standard multiplicative closed subset you know 1 h h square h to the power so in your h that's what it is so these notations will be in effect throughout the talk so so that i don't have to keep repeating all right <coughs> So now let's start with some standard preliminaries for this particular talk. So first notion is a set of elements uh, thought of as a vector a one a two a r. It's called the unimodular row to be ideal generated by the a i in the whole ring r. That means I can find b i in the ring r so that sigma a i b i is equal to one. That's a standard. Notion of the unimodular row, and what does this mean? This means that you can look at the map, uh, R module map given from R, up R direction R R times to R by sending a basis element to E I, uh, A I, and that map is on. That's what it means. That means you have got a map from R direction R R R copies to capital R. it is on to so therefore the kernel is obviously a projective module because it's a surjective module or free module and so you get a projective module p as the kernel with the property that p direct sum r is isomorphic to uh r top little r copies of capital r the study of such projective modules called stability modules is an important one and that that has occupied many people at many levels so our main interest would be to conditions on this uh, vector a which makes projective module p to be actually free and not just projective and if so if the a gives me a free module we say a is completable that's just a word not so important all right <clears throat> so so that that keep in mind that we will often have the situation of a 
uh, a vector like unimodular vector given like this, and you would like to know whether the corresponding predictive model. And when I say the corresponding predictive model, it is a kernel map. And that that predictive model is free. And that is what is our one of our main interests in this uh, game is going to be. Okay. <clears throat> So here are the two important results that I want to mention in this direction, which we will use. One of them is if you start with the unimodular row or any ring, then I can look at A0 raised to D0, A1 raised to D1, et cetera, AR raised to DR. And see, of course, that's also unimodular row by obvious uh, taking powers, et cetera. So this is completable if R factorial divides product of DR. Huh? Very important theorem. So A naught A to A R is just enough to But when I raise each of them to certain power, and with the power, product of the powers is actually a multiple of R factorial, then it is completable. Uh, very, very beautiful, fancy theorem by Susslin. Very elementary proof. If you have never seen a proof, please read it. It's a very, very beautiful theorem. Uh, and uh, this is proved by Suslin. And of course, this is a sufficient condition for something to be completable, but it's also necessary in general. So there are uh, cases where you can find that you have to find how the VI is multiple of R factorial and nothing less will do. Then you will not be completable. So that's a great theorem of Suslin. All right. And the next theorem, again, all of you probably are familiar with. Now, in this case, we look at the case of R, not, not an arbitrary ring anymore, but a polynomial ring in an, another ring S. So R is equal to S bracket Y, a polynomial ring. And again, you have a unimodular row over this particular in R. If A1 is monic in Y, then A is completable. This is the famous theorem of Quillen and Suslin. Uh, as many of you probably are familiar with. <clears throat> so by just knowing that one of the polynomials and therefore any one of them to be monic, automatically we have three models. And in particular, projective models over polynomials in class three. Because polynomial ring, you know that take a projective model, when you invert some non-zero element, you can make it free. But any non-zero polynomial after change of variable is monic. That's what Noether normalization lemma essentially uses. Therefore, inverting a monic polynomial, it is free, and therefore it is actually free. Okay, so that is basically the game. All right, so now let's go back. Now we come to the important question, which in some sense motivated many of this stuff that comes afterwards, is a question by Powerman Murthy. Uh, the question says, take an ideal in a polynomial ring, then the first question is, is mu of i mod i square equal to mu of i? Huh? Obviously, of course, mu of i is bigger than or equal to mu of i mod i square, but uh, whether it is actually equal for a polynomial ring. And the next, next question is, you look at the arithmetic rank of i, mu s of i, is it always less than or equal to mu of i mod i square? Uh, two two uh, important questions by Murthy. All right. So let's see what we know about this. So both, of course, the first thing to say is that why, why does Murthy do this with the polynomial ring? So both have negative answers. If you replace R above in the instead of a polynomial ring, let's say you uh, put, a, put a dedicate domain, then, then both the questions have negative answers. Because in the case of first question, if you take any non-principal ideal of a, of a, of a dedicate domain, I mod I square will be, of course, because it is dedicated domain, I mod I square will be free of rank one, whereas I itself is not generated by one element. So mu of I mod I square will be one, but mu of I is not one because it is not principal. And similarly, if we take a non torsion ideal, take an ideal I, they all give me non zero ideals from the class group, and the class group may not have torsion, there will be non torsion elements in general. And you take a non torsion element, then the second question obviously fails for such ideals. Okay. All right. So, so, so the, I'm, I've justified Murthy's question that why it should be thought of as a question in the polynomial ring case. Huh? In fact, much fancier 
answers can be made uh, why it should be a polynomial ring and not other rings, but we will not go into it in this talk. Okay, so in this talk, what will have what the aim says that we will see that the second question has an affirmative answer due to Borodinsky. And the first is true under some extra hypothesis, but open in general. It is still okay. Uh, and an affirmative answer to the first question was claimed by Fossil and published in the annals a few years ago, but had some fatal flaws pointed out by Mandel and Das. So, so ultimately, you know, there is no concept of withdrawing papers because once it is published, it's published. So, but it is not correct. I mean, there are the, 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 I mean, there are many interesting results in that paper of Fossil, but. But the main theorem that he claims to prove is, in fact, incomplete. The proof is incomplete. So the pr problem is still open. Okay. Now, let's look at... So I want to try to understand these two questions. So what am I going to do? So, so the, Dedekind, uh, the Dedekind domain example suggests if we just lift some generator of I mod I squared to... It's, in general, not going to generate time. Obviously, and that's what Dedekind domain said. So you cannot, so without using the power of polynomial ring, there is no real way of uh, arbitrary lifts going to help you. So that's, so, <clears throat> but what we are going to see below that I'll come to later, but I just want to explain what is going to be done. See below that, we can always find some element H in I. Okay, so you have got, square and you got i but you got an h in i we will find an edge so that these lifts these arbitrary lifts will generate it may not lift it may not generate i but it will generate i localized at one minus h the localization in other words to use geometric language what does one minus h inverting means that means we are looking at the set of prime ideals where <coughs> uh, one minus h is non-zero that means h is like one so that means that the neighborhood of my variety i, whole neighborhood of variety of i, these lifts will generate i. That's the basic principle. Okay, so that's uh, we we have not done this. We have not found this h, but we will do it later. Okay, so the attempt is to use the special properties of polynomial rings to ex extend these generators. And so. In a whole neighborhood of I, V of I, we know we can generate by these arbitrary lifts. Some other we want to extend this to the whole R, which uh, will, as I said, for Dedekind domain, this is going to fail. Whereas uh, for polynomial ring, some other we are hoping that we can do this. And the, we are, I'm going to explain the basic technique of how to uh, generate this from a hook to the whole thing. Okay. All right. So this is called patch. So let's start with the simplest case. Let R, let it take a ring R and let H be an element of R. And now it will be an R H module, R localized at H, and M2 be an R1 minus H module. So why is H and 1 minus H? That means any prime ideal P uh, will survive in R H or R1 minus H. In other words, geometrically speaking, we have found two open subsets of spec R, which cover all of spec R. And so, and you have given on one open set M1, the other open set M2. And assume now we are given on the intersection of these two open sets, which means what is the intersection? That means you invert H as well as one minus H. That means R H one minus H. In that module, we have assume you have given an isomorphism of this. M, M1, one minus H, remember is a, a module over R H one minus H. And M2 inverted H is a module again over the same ring. Assume you are given an isomorphism between those. Then we can patch these modules to get a module M over R such that MH is isomorphic to M1, M1 minus H is isomorphic to M2. That is our patching procedure, right? You're given two things in an open set. All or other subjects, this is very commonly done. You're given two, you cover the space with open sets, given objects on these spaces. On the intersection, you give a patching data, and then you patch them up. And those who have not seen this have given a one-step construction here. Take M1 and consider the subset M consisting of 
is m comma m with this property phi m equal to n, where phi m is your uh, patching map. Uh, then you, this m will have the required property that you get a whole module over the whole ring, uh, which localizes to m1 and m2 and the appropriate uh, localizations. Very good. So now I want to go, I mean, having said this for one module, I want to do it a little more. <clears throat> so the above can be easily adapted to the following slide generalization, which is what? Now you are given uh, Rh and R1 minus H as before, and you are given sequences of modules on both the spaces. Uh, R1 and R2, so I equal one to two. So, and you are also given patching for N1, 1 minus H to N2, 1, N2 H, M1, 1 minus H to M2 H, P1 minus H to P2 H. Maybe patching. So everything is compatible. The patching is compatible with the alphas and betas. Then you match these two exact sequences together to get an exact sequence. So remember, the patching on just one piece gives me a module on the whole, whole R, etc. So you get an N, P, and M, and, you, and it fits into an exact sequence. That's the basic uh, path, uh, patching. Okay. So now let me go back to, this is an abstract theory. So let me go back to our situation of interest. Okay. So in our situation, we have R, so let's say fixed number little r to be mu of i mod i square. Then we, as I said, we proved that yet. We have not shown there is a h and 1 minus h, etc. <coughs> for the moment, then you have an exact sequence like this on, on the open set 1 minus h. Remember, when you invert 1 minus h, uh, once you lift an arbitrary set of generators of i mod i square to i, then you can find an h and a 1 minus h. That's my hope. So that when you invert 1 minus h, these generators generate my idea. So I have this exact sequence. Very good. N2 is defined as just the kernel of that map. This map is given by the generators. OK. And then we can take over Rh a trivial exact sequence. Remember, when I invert h on i, h is an element of i. Therefore, i inverted h will be the whole of ring. So I have Rh. So I just take the obvious, some obvious exact sequence where this map is just taking, let's say, the first basis element to one, the rest of the basis elements to zero. And that's a, a second exact sequence. So then trivial exact sequence, uh, given by the vector one, zero, 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 zero. This is given by the vector of uh, the generators that you have chosen of i mod i square lifts to i. So if you knew the terms, so now what do we want? We want to patch these things together to get something on the whole ring. You got one on one minus h not equal to zero and the one on h not equal to zero. And we have noticed that though we are interested on the right hand side of the picture in one and two, really the patching says, see, I have to do something about the left hand side. I need to understand what happens to terms which I'm not really interested in, but that's what you, where the game is actually played. Uh, so we know the terms on that. If I see somehow that I can make these two guys, n2 and r, r, uh, h r minus one, on the uh, intersection uh, isomorphic, then you can hope to patch everything together. That's the plan. So if the terms on the left two are isomorphic to over Rh1 minus H, we should be able to patch this. But remember to patch in the intersection, what happens? This guy is a free module. So when you re restrict to the open set, one minus H invert, you still a free module of rank R minus one. So really the issue is to make sure that this guy becomes free when I uh, when I restrict to the open set. Hmm? So if we can arrange n to h to be a free module of rank r minus one or r h one minus h, we will have a project. These two things patch up. This is when you patch up a free module on two open sets, so you get a projective module. So you get a projective model of rank r mapping onto r. That's that's all. So our uh, uh, focus is completely understood. Now you start with these two exact sequences, which are given by some method. You really have to make this guy free over when I invert uh, invert uh, over R H one minus H. Huh? So I invert H on N two. I get the module over that ring, and that uh, that you want to some other make to be free, and then you have a projective module mapping onto I of the correct rank, huh? where R is that little R is mu of i mod i squared. So that's our, so keep that in focus. That really each time, whenever these games are played, that's what we're trying to do, okay? 
one basic focus. All right. Okay, let's continue. Uh, and if you knew it, that the predictive module X, Y, this is general construction of our arbitrary ring. But if you do this uh, and the, or the polynomial ring now, now we use the power of the polynomial ring and say, oh, you have a projective model of rank R mapping onto I, but the projective modules of our polynomial rings are free by equivalent and Suslin, and therefore uh, a free model rank R mapping onto an ideal is same as saying the ideal is generated by R. Huh? And keep, one thing you have to keep in mind is that I did not explicitly try to take these generators given by my list and modify it to get the generators for I. That would be very difficult. What I have done is to modify these modules maps so that ultimately you've got a free module mapping into I. And the generators of the three modules are unknown at that point. They come abstractly from some procedure. So the generators that you're going to get for my actual ideal R generators uh, are, have probably little to do with the original generators that I started with. And so the physically trying to create, extend these generators was difficult, but by this little backdoor method, achieve the same effect. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Very good. Let's continue. So our primary aim is to choose the generators i mod i square and h and i in such a way that the n2 we obtain from the exact sequence satisfies the property that n2 h is a free module of rank r minus 1 over r h1 minus h. So our goal is completely in all the uh, this particular game we have, one, we have kind of fixed our game to make sure that this create this map and make sure this guy is free, n2 h is free. There you go. So now, we, now I, as I promised, we will do the lemma which proves the existence of H and 1 minus H. So we start with a very elementary lemma. So take any ideal of any ring and assume U of I mod I square equal to R and take any set of lifts, F and F to FR, any lifts of a set of generators of I mod I square. Then F and F to FR is going to look like I intersection J for a suitable ideal J where i and j are co-maximal, uh, i plus j is equal to r. If a is in i and b is in j, are such that a plus b equal to 1, then i is in fact generated by f and f to f r comma a. It doesn't matter what a is, as long as a plus b equal to 1, you take i plus j is r, so I can find an a in i, b in j with a plus b equal to 1, take any such a and b, then automatically f and f to f r a is 1, I think the ideal generator. So in particular, you can see, uh, mu of i mod i square is r, then i is generated always by r plus 1 elements. Huh? I mean, whereas our aim is to somehow that make sure that r plus 1 becomes actually r under suitable hypothesis. That's the idea. Okay. Okay, the proof is very easy. After picking f arbitrary f and f to f r, you pick, uh, then define my j to be, I have to find what j is. j is just a colon ideal. Huh? Colon ideal, if you remember, is a set of all elements in the ring R, which when I multiply by uh, I, goes into F and F to F R. That's a colon ideal. And then uh, denote by, so now denote by, if I take the F and F to F R, and Nakai Maslama said, I prime, as I said earlier, that near I, uh, these F and F to F R will automatically generate my ideal because of Nakai Ma. So I prime, when I look at it, I prime and I becomes equal near uh, the ideal I. So the J will have the property, it will be co-maximal with uh, I. And uh, then it is easy to check one and two. And the third can easily check the same principle. For comma A, I want to say it's equal to I. Uh, for this, you take any F in I and then I write f as f can be written as f times 1, f times 1, 1 is a plus b, so I write it as a plus b, then you have fa plus fb, and you can see fa, of course, is already in i double prime because a is there, and fb, f is in <coughs> i, so f, fb is in i intersection a, b is in j, so fb is in i intersection a, and so fb is also in f and f to fr, this is there, so everything is there. Very good. Okay, so that's a very elementary lemma. 
Now let's go on to Baratinsky's theorem. At this point, Baratinsky's theorem becomes very easy. <clears throat> so take any ideal i in a ring R uh, and let R equal to mu of i mod i square. Then there exists an ideal i prime contained in i with the radical of i prime equal to i and the projective module of rank R mapping onto i prime. In particular, if R is a polynomial ring, the arithmetic rank is at most r because projective modules are free. Okay, that's the basic thing. Okay, so I'm going to give a proof, very easy proof. As before, we pick an arbitrary set of generators of i mod i in i generating i mod i square, exactly as in the lemma. And then you from lemma says I have this little h and one minus h and j. In lemma, there was take any a and b with a plus b equal to one. So take a to be h, and then b is 1 minus a, which is 1 minus h. So that, that's the situation that you have. So that i is equal to f1, f2, fr, comma, h. This is what the lemma said. Now, I can take any positive integer d and consider a new ideal, which I call i prime d. The bracket d is just to denote that it depends on this number d. <coughs> and that's equal to the idea generated one f2, f, all the way to fr minus don't change anything, but fr, you raise it to the dth power, and h also you raise to the dth power. And that is some idea. Okay. And notice that uh, 1 minus h whole raised to d times h raised to d is in this idea, uh, because 1 minus h times h is in f1, f2, fr, therefore. Very good. So that is in that idea. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so clearly, radically, these two don't change. I mean, I have taken f1, f2, fr raised to d and h raised to d. When I take the radical, I get everything f1, f2, fr is here and h is here. So uh, radically, i prime d and i are exactly the same. So okay. now i prime d, we can look at our famous exact sequence that I've always focused on. Namely, when I invert 1 minus h, uh, i prime d is generated by f1, f2, fr raised to d. So I get this map. Remember this map from R uh, 1 minus H raised to R to I prime D 1 minus H is given by F1, F2, FR minus 1, comma, FR raised to D. Okay, and the kernel is junk N to D, which I want to understand. And it's a junk which I don't want to think about, but that's what exactly what I'm focusing on. So now we wish to make sure that when I take N to D and invert H, I want to make it free over RH1 minus H. And then we'll be done by the philosophy that we have expounded earlier. But N2 DH is given by the unimodular row F1, F2, FR raised to D, as I said. And by the beautiful result of Switzerland we mentioned earlier, it's free if R minus 1 factorial divides the product of the indices, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, and D. So if it divides D. So I just take D to be D was completely arbitrary here. I could have taken any D. I take d to be r minus 1 factorial, and I would be done. That means I have a projective module of rank r mapping onto i, I prime of d. d in this case is r minus 1 factorial, and, there, and it's radically the same as i. And when you reach polynomial ring, projective modules are free, and you're done. Is that OK? Good. So let's go on if there are nothing at this point. OK, now I come to uh, Murthy's question. OK, <clears throat> and the first question of Murthy and uh, my partial answer. Okay. So here, Murthy asked, as I told you, that if you mu of i mod i square equal to r, you want to know whether mu of i is equal to r. Uh, whereas in the theorem I'm going to state, if there's an extra hypothesis, namely, I assume in addition, R is sufficiently large. R is bigger than or equal to 2 plus dimension of R mod I. Hmm? OK? <clears throat> and that's a weakness. I mean, so in other words, if R is small, I don't know how to prove this. Huh? The, the most is question. I do not know how to answer it. And essentially, it is still open, as I said. <clears throat> and the proof will become clear once I explain the role played by the actor assumption that I made. Why did I make this assumption R is bigger than or equal to 2 plus dimension of R mod I? In what role does it really play? Huh? That, that uh, uh, inequality. So that's, I will explain that and then it will become very, everything will become very clear. Okay. 
Okay, so this time we choose not just any lift of I mod I square generated through I mod I square, like which I did for the Baratinsky's theorem or in the lemma, but I, I mean, I choose slightly, a little more careful and choose quote unquote general set of lifts. In other words, you know, you remember there are so many possibilities for a lift. If I can lift, if I take an uh, element in I mod I square, I can lift it to something. And then I can add anything in I square to it and then still it's a lift. So, so you have a large possible variations of lifts. So, but here I take a sufficiently general lift. So, so if I do that, this is the usual uh, in commutative algebra and algebraic geometry. Uh, when you do this, remember I square, you cannot change what happens in I, uh, but we are adding, allowing to add anything in I square to these guys which means outside variety of I, you can do whatever you want with these elements, whatever you can, whatever is possible, you can do. In particular, you can make sure that the prime avoidance kind of theorems will say that you can make the outside I, V of I, the height can be made as nice as you want. Huh? Cruz principle theorem can be applied neatly outside. Inside, you, I, near I, you don't have that much control. But outside I, you have a lot of control when you want to, when you do this. So by the usual prime avoidance ensures that if you write, if you, as you said, F1, F2, FR is equal to I intersection J as before, the main point is then you can, these guys at I, I don't know, I, height of I, I did not know to start with. But J, I can assume has co-height exactly R, that means height exactly R, which means dimension of R mod J, I can always assume to be less than or equal to N minus R. Okay, that's the main point of taking general uh, generator lifts. So the hypothesis implies our, uh, we had an inequality in the in the theorem I stated, and uh, R mod J has dimension less than or equal to this. Put them together, that converts into an inequality like this. N is N. Plus dimension of R mod J plus one. Okay, that's the basic inequality we get by using the assumption in the theorem. And what is this magic number on the right? This is precisely the dimension of the join of these two varieties, Vi and Vj. Remember, let me, let me think of this geometrically. We will do this in the next slide. We will do it in algebraically. We'll say this again. But Vi and Vj are two disjoint things sitting inside affine space of dimension n. And we are, and one of them has dimension of course r mod i, the other one has dimension r mod j. And if I take a point in one and a point in the other and take the line joining them and put the, all these lines together, that's called the join of the two varieties. Now, what is the dimension of the join? Dimension of the join, you, you have the, a, a point on this variety can vary along dimension r mod i dimension. This guy dimension R mod J, and for each point you have a each two points you have a line joining them. So dimension of R mod I plus dimension of R mod J plus one. And that's the dimension of the join. So when you take the join, it has dimension exactly that. And so what is the advantage? And N is larger. That means <coughs> the join is not the whole affine space. Which means if I take a general point. Technically, I should say at infinity, but let me think of it uh, geometrically, kind of intuitively. So, if I take a general affine space outside the join, what is the advantage of this? When you take the projection from a point, that particular point which is away from all this, this stuff, when you project to the uh, one dimensional lower, these two varieties remain disjoint. Typically, if I project uh, uh, two disjoint varieties from uh, an arbitrary point, they may intersect in the in the projected variety. But why is that? Because that means this variety and the point on this variety go to the same point, means that on the same line connecting from the point of projection. But here we are projecting from a uh, point which is not on any of the uh, points on the join, on the line join in the points. So when you project, you get something disjoint. That's the real, that's the real crux of the whole matter of this number adding up to something large.
Okay? I hope I hope I have made this clear, and it's good to think about it a little more. But that's really what what's happening. Okay. So so rewrite this whole concept algebraically. What does it mean? A generic projection is just a choice of variables. Right? After all, you're projecting from a finite space to a finite minus one space. Generic means you choose a set of variables generically. Yeah? So and then you drop the deep projection means dropping one or one of the variables. So so I can write my ring R as S bracket Y. Yeah? This is one of the Y is one of the variables, but generically chosen. Then what we have is when I projections are disjoint means. When I take i intersection s and j intersection s, they are co-maximal in s. They, they don't intersect, mean they have nothing in common, so they are co-maximal in s. And that's a real point of that number count. Also, we may assume because generically, we are doing generically because uh, uh, Noether normalization lemma says this f1, f2, fr, we have this bunch of polynomials. Uh, they could, one of them and all of them can be monic in y. Uh, that's what generic projection always does for. So two two things have been achieved. So we have we have written R by this extra hypothesis on the dimension. We have written my R as a polynomial ring in one variable over a S S, and the intersections I intersection S J intersections are co-maximal. Also, we may assume by generosity the F one or all of them, if you like, is monic in one. Uh, so now, because these two i intersection s and j intersection s are co-maximal, we may choose our h. Remember, our h was some arbitrary element in i and j. So h plus one minus h equal one. H is in <coughs> i, one minus h is in j, etc. But now these are co-maximal, so I can choose my h to be in i intersection s and one minus h to be in j intersection s. And that's the extra thing that you can do because of all this. Very good. Now we write. Our exact spin, right? I mean, we always go back to where our focus is never left out. I and mean, you always want to write this exact sequence. Once you have your status f and f2 fr, you have your h and one minus h, you write your exact sequence, and that's what you have. Now we want to know as before whether n2h is free over this guy. But this because h and one minus h are in s and not in all of r. When I invert h and 1 minus h, I get a polynomial ring in one variable y over this ring, h, h, s inverted h 1 minus h. So it's still a polynomial ring in one variable. And it is given by the unimodular row f1, f2, fr. This is the exact sequence. Remember, the map was given by f1, f2, fr, where the f1, f2 are generators. Okay? And in addition, we know by generosity, f1 is monic in y. And and uh, when Quill and Susselin tells us that this module has to be free, we have a module which is uh, given by unimodular row f and f projective model given by f and f to f r over this polynomial ring over a different ring, of course, but it's polynomial ring in Y, and f n is monic, and therefore Quill and Susselin says that this module is free n two localized at h. And remember, that is always our focus. Try to make n2h for free. And Quillen Susselin tells us that it is. Therefore, we can patch. OK? So I, I, I hope, are there any questions at this point? OK. Let's continue. Now we go to the case of curves, the, the, that, the one that Lily was discussing, so we'll do that. So let's take uh, an ideal in a polynomial ring. I assume now, see, uh, what the, the, the Cauchy Knorr theorem, if you remember, one of the main features of that, of course, Boratinsky makes it easier, but one of the main features of that was to start with an arbitrary curve in characteristic P. And then you can do something to it so that you can actually make it to a first, you can make it into a local complete intersection. Once you have a local complete intersection, then, for example, this theorem will finish the proof. Uh, so that's a plan, right? I mean, the main point there was the arbitrary uh, curve, which is not a local complete intersection, can be set theoretically defined by a local complete intersection ideal. 
that was really the crux of the matter. And and I must also thank uh, Kaushik for all this. And I'm sure Kaushik is in the audience. And uh, that you know he you know, when when he was when he and Madhav were doing these uh, things, he came and asked me, "Hey, for n equal to three, we you know Shapiro does this. Can we do this for arbitrary n?" And I said, "Yeah, my theorem will do this." Then he said, "Why haven't you written it up?" I said, "Well, I didn't think of it." So he pushed me into writing this as a corollary in my paper. Otherwise, it would not have probably been there. So I thank Kaushik for making me do this. All right. <clears throat> So now we can. So we have wanted to define a complete intersection, local complete intersection curve. Then it is a set theoretic complete intersection. Huh? So this is the part that we believe uh, suggested, uh, kind of used in some level or the other. Uh, okay. Excuse me. Uh, there is a comment from Satya Mandal saying that I do not think all of Kaushik Nori follows from uh, Borakinsky. No, once it is local complete intersection, we will do it in a minute. You will see in a few minutes. Once you know local, you see, Baratinsky came much later than all this. Kaushik Nori and my paper were earlier than Baratinsky. So, is that okay? All right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, the theorem, of course, is trivial for n equal to 1 and 2. n equal to 1, there is nothing to prove. n equal to 2, it's a plane curve. It's a, any, ideal is, any ideal defining a curve is actually a complete intersection given by one equation. And n equal to 3 was proved by Ferrand and Spiro. And I would like to say that uh, my mentor Spiro passed away a couple of months ago. Uh, and he was a close, close friend. And I mean, without him, I would probably have learned much less mathematics than I do now. So, and the theorem above will do this uh, for n bigger than or equal to 4, huh? which I will explain in a minute. Of course, all this can be done also using Baratinsky's theorem. Okay. <clears throat> so the main idea is due to Ferran, while some, sometimes the part of it is, I'm, historically I'm not quite clear, but some foursome had a, Similar idea, which is worked out anyway. So, but often we call it the Ferran construction. So we sketch this construction. Okay. So let's take an ideal I contained in R, a polynomial ring with n bigger than or equal to three, but define a local complete intersection curve. Then I want to understand uh, some. So I mean, I want to make this construction due to Ferran. So I mod I square, but local complete intersection basically says I mod I square is then a module over R mod I, which is the projective module of rank N minus one. We are looking at curves. And since N is bigger than or equal to three, N minus one is strictly bigger than one. Yeah. Okay. The canonical module therefore makes sense. Uh, omega R mod I is an R mod I projective module of rank one because it's a local complete intersection curve. Since rank of I mod I squared is strictly bigger than one by uh, theorem of Bas, when you have a one dimensional ring and you have a projective module of rank bigger than one, you can make it subject onto any projective module of rank one. That is part of Bas's theorem. And it's a much more general theorem. And some people may say it's not Bas, it's actually Serre. I, I know, and I learned it from Sayers, uh, uh, I mean, in, in, from Mumford's book, uh, where it's attributed to Sayer, but there are too many issues there, but I will not go there. But anyway, mod i square maps on to omega r mod i. You can always find some surjective map from i mod i square to omega r mod i. And that's what we are going to use. So now one takes the push out. So you give up. So I mod I square map onto omega R mod I. I mod I square, of course, sitting inside R mod I square as an ideal, the square zero ideal. Quotient is R mod I, so I can take the push out. When you take the push out, you get a something because this map is onto, this map is onto, so I can write it as R mod J. Sorry, uh, Mohan, maybe you should just remark that this is uh, suggestion is on rank one because it's a curve. That's it's a curve, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's, as I said, that's a much more general theorem, but for the curve 
case, rank one, omega R mod I is rank one, I mod I squared is the projective model of rank bigger than one, then you can always find such a rejection. Okay? Very good. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> so you have got a surjective map and you have got a surjective map, so you have a surjective map here. So I can write it as R mod J. Okay? The reason I have written this R mod J is because this map is surjective. So J is some ideal in R. Which, which contains I square and contained in I. Hmm? So that's the situation. Okay. And now you, I square is contained in J and contained in I. So J and I define the same variety. So set is basically they are the same. Uh, Man, there is a question uh, about what is, J, what is J in this slide? J, J is defined by this procedure because the push out is onto here. This guy is onto. Okay. I mod I square, the phi, the map phi is on to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. R mod I square to whatever you get the push out will be on to. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you when on to means I can it's a quotient of R mod I square. So I can write it as R mod J for some ideal J. So, then, so this, this ideal can be defined as as a kernel of I mean denominator of kernel of map. Yeah, I mean it will be I square over j over i square. J I mean, that, that you can look at other sources, no? I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can look at <laughs> my book. Okay. Yeah. The subjectivity of phi is what makes it look. Okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that uh, so 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 the idea is Ferran construction. Look at this J; it's theoretically same as I. So if I knew J was, we are going to look at J carefully and see what what we can say about J. Okay, so in other words, I can replace my I with J, and the idea is that okay. Let me put the go to the next slide. Maybe it'll get clearer. <coughs> J is still a local company intersection. So the idea is to look at everything. Remember everything, understanding everything about J by using this, this push-out diagram and then looking at locally, all information can be derived. Because when I go to <coughs> locally, this becomes a free module of rank one. You can look, this is a free module of rank two, rank N minus one. You can look at the map and you can see exactly what J looks like locally. I mean, how many generators does it need? What are the properties it has? Everything is very easy, transparently done locally. The map is global. Okay, so then you can see immediately J is still a local company intersection because locally the pusher diagram becomes transparent. And more importantly, the canonical bundle omega R mod J is actually R mod J, isomorphic to R mod J. Unlike in the previous case, the this guy omega R mod I was some arbitrary projective model rank one, but the, this procedure if you look at cal calculate omega of R mod J using this exact sequence at the bottom, you will see omega R mod J is in fact three over R mod J. Hmm? That's the real point. Okay. Then it is not difficult to see. Uh, this is a part I did not uh, write an exact proof, but I can. I, I have a separate slide if you want people to have a look at it later on. Uh, that J mod J square is actually a free module of rank n minus one. The general principle is that if you have a local company intersection ideal, then uh, let's say J, then uh, J mod J square, the maximal exterior is the omega. Uh, in this case, J mod J square, the maximal exterior is R mod J. Therefore, uh, and Bass's theorem will say uh, that it is in fact it's actually free of right and minus one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now the proof of the theorem is clear. Either I appeal to Boratinsky because J mod J square is free, then Boratinsky will say J itself is the arithmetic rank of J is actually n minus one. Clear. Uh, so or use our original proof. As I said, Boratinsky's theorem came much later than uh, our proofs. So so let me illustrate what happened. The original idea. If, if n is equal to three, then say construction, where most of these 
polynomial ring, free projective, free, etc. Remember, all came from Sayer's idea of the Sayer construction. So the, let me explain Sayer construction. Omega R mod J is X1 JR. That's a, that one of the definition of Omega in the case of N equal to 3. Then the general, and this is R mod J. So I have a 1 in R mod J, the you know, element generating R mod J. So that gives you an extension 0 to R to P to J to 0. And Sayer checked in his own calculation, then Sayer's seminar Dubriel checked that, this, that P is projective of rank 2 because it's given by this extension class 1. And then uh, appeal to Murthy Tauber or Quill and Susselin to say P is free. <laughs> Murthy Tauber proved polynomial thing and three variable projective modules are free, so which is okay. Or Quill and Susselin. <clears throat> Very good. And if n is bigger than or equal to 4, what happens? Then mu of j mod j square, which we know is n minus 1. It's a free model of rank n minus 1, which is bigger than or equal to 3, because n is bigger than or equal to 4. And 3 is equal to 2 plus dimension of r mod j. Remember, r mod j is 1. Dimension of r mod j is 1. So, so I can appeal to my theorem to conclude that mu j is n minus. Oh, I, put a, I put a minus, but it should be an equality. Mu j is equal to n minus 1. OK? Very good. So, so unlike Borodinsky, the main slight advantage here is Borodinsky, when you have mu of j mod j squared is n minus 1, <coughs> Borodinsky will tell you that it is, in fact, uh, the arithmetic rank is n minus 1. That means we have to change your j. But these theorems say that you don't have to change j. j itself is, in fact, generated by n minus 1 elements. OK? And that more or less is what I wanted to say. Let me end this with a few questions. So obvious question, of course, is what can one say about Murthy's question when R is equal to mu of i mod square well, small? The only result I'm aware of is that I, I don't know whether it is published yet, but K is the algebraic closure of a finite field, then one other uh, this that my uh, inequality was R is bigger than or equal to two plus dimension of R mod i but it can be improved to one plus dimension of R mod i if k is uh, algebraic closure of a finite field. Okay. And of course, uh, this, this is uh, Dilip also asked this question, natural question. Are curves set theoretic complete intersection over a field of characteristic zero? Unlike Kaushik Nori, does it for characteristic positive? Okay. I just want to mention a couple of uh, things. I mean, uh, this would have made, for example, some of the argument deletes a little more uh, easier to write down. That is, it is easy to check that if I take two set theoretic complete intersection curve, then the union is also a set theoretic complete intersection. Okay, so, so in other words, to check for set theoretic complete intersection, you only have to look at irreducible curves. If I knew all irreducible curves are a set theoretic complete intersection, then automatically any curve is a set theoretic complete intersection. Similarly, a, a small statement, a curve which is linked in one step to a smooth curve is a set theoretic complaint section. Mm -hmm. So if I can take a smooth curve and I can link it to a, uh, my given curve is linked by one step to a smooth curve, <coughs> then it is also a set theoretic complaint section. Yeah, we know that any curve can be linked to a smooth curve in finitely many steps, but this is a statement about one step linkage, okay? OK, and uh, now something about projective spaces. Uh, famous question of Kronecker, are connected curves in P and set theoretic couple intersections? Mm -hmm. Connectedness is necessary by a theorem of Hartshorn, the local homology computation. Here, even for smooth curves, we do not know the answer. But it is true that, again, the connected union of a set theoretic couple intersection and the line are still set theoretic complete intersections. In other words, you can take a curve, which is set theoretic complete intersection, take any line, but it has to be connected. So I assume they are connected. Then union is still a set theoretic complete intersection. So in particular, finitely many un uh, connected union of finitely many lines is a set theoretic complete intersection in PI. And I, I the amusing question of Gennady, which is which is which all came from these kinds of questions. You take any. This is a more number theoretic flavor question. Is every close point in P2Q a set theoretic complete intersection? 
So P to C is of course trivial. Any any point is a company given by intersection of two lines. But now we have working over rational numbers. So points have degrees. The you know, close points are not no longer necessarily Q rational. So take an arbitrary point in P to Q is it a set theory of the intersection? It's a very nice question. I mean, for curve case, Bernardi wanted to do this for P two over, let's say. A function field in one variable over C are points in their complete section. That is the that is where he started, and so so in particular we you know he ended up with this question, which is interesting. I mean, for small degrees you can do it by hand, but large degree points we don't know what. To do. Okay, that's all. I need. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, Mon, uh, for your very nice talk. Uh, now, now the floor is open for audience to ask any questions. Either uh, they can open their mic one by one, or they ask questions in chat box. Um, I'll make a general comment, if I may. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, many pro certain problems are stuck for a long time. Okay. I, one question that comes to my mind is Jacobian conjecture. Okay. And I feel this problem is at the same level of difficulty or getting stuck. Yeah, that's a comment I want to make. You know, I mean, um, yeah, thank you. So, by this problem, you mean the problem about set theoretic complete intersection characteristic zero? I mean, both this mu i mod i square problem, the Murthy's question mu i mod i square is equal to mu i, um, as well the set theory complete intersection problem. The, no progress has been made, okay? I mean, since um, I, um, Koshik Nori proved his theorem, or Mohan Kumar um, proved his theorem, okay? And I mean, I added a um, Monic polynomial and did it, you know, but um, yeah, that is only that, okay. But that um, bound for mu i mod i square problem that mu i mod i square is bigger than or equal to dimension r mod i plus 2, okay, um, r is the polynomial ring, that nobody could crack. Mohan is saying that, you know, I mean, you can reduce it by one, I don't know, I didn't see that paper uh, for finite fields, okay. I did not see that paper. Okay. Other than I that, I've forgotten who wrote it. Was it Das who wrote it? I, I don't know. I never never saw it. Okay. I, uh, you know, I, well, I don't yeah. accept results that has not been um, that has not been checked. Okay. Meaning, I mean, puzzles paper is a lesson. Okay. So yeah. So I I wouldn't accept it until I have seen that everyone has enough competent people have. Um, have looked at it, but anyway, that, that may be true. You know, that that's the only um, um, progress, if at all. Okay, other than that, nobody could break that that inequality. Yeah, and Koshik Nori, um, the same thing. Thanks. Uh, Manoj uh, comments that this is Smrinal's paper in advances in math. Exactly. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't want to. I have not seen the published version yet. Yeah, but I, I mean, I was the referee, so. Okay. Are there any other questions from audience? So there is a question from Vinay Vag. Uh, is there any way or special cases to compute minimal generating set for modules over quotient of polynomial ring? Uh, what what information is one going to put in? Well, uh, suppose your module is given yeah, by some. You can, you can have modules of all kinds in over quotient of polynomial rings. So unless you are willing to put in some data. Like, like that was the basic principle of uh, Foster's estimate or Eisenberg Ivan's estimate, etc. Right? I mean, you know, Foster's one here tells you, given local information of number of generators, you have an idea of the global estimate. 
Yeah, something like uh, in case of squillen susli, we have, uh, I mean, using squillen susli for uh, uh, modules over polynomial ring, we can estimate or we can get the actual minimal number of generator. No, you cannot. I mean, depend on what you need to put in. I mean, the squillen susli only. What I mean was something like villain susli kind of uh, variant for uh, polynomial quotient rings. Uh, Okay. No, Suslin is a statement by projective model. Right. Are you talking about projective model? Uh, I actually would like to translate that into uh, the uh, minimal number of generator kind of thing. I mean, other than treating the uh, projective modules over that, I mean, that computing the uh, minimal no. generator. Sorry, I, 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 I don't understand your question. Uh, uh, unless you have some information. You Maybe I. Hundred generators. It needs hundred generators. How do you know? What are the information that you're? Yeah. Maybe he is looking for it. If he is looking for an estimate, we have uh, Eisenberg Evans estimate and such. Foster Swan. If you want the quotient for of polynomial rings, you have Foster Swan. Let's begin. Okay. Okay. There's a question from Nina. Nina, can you ask your question? Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. So my yeah. question is very basic. Uh, in the beginning, you have mm. said that uh, this uh, unimodular row uh -huh. is completable or not. Means uh, that oh. is uh, uh, converse is also true that R factorial should divide the product of di. That is not something very clear to me in general. Means what does that mean? Because uh, I can have the power it's already it's there in the. If, if you if you have if you take start with an arbitrary union of the row a one a two a r, hmm? okay. a not okay a one a two a r, okay. and then we raise it to some power. Yeah. And then we want to know what power will make this unimodular. I may always so, start with an unimodular row which is completed. If it is completable, then every power is completable too. Okay. So. So maybe Nina um, uh, should look at uh, Swan's paper. I mean, the Swan's paper preceding uh, Swan's annals paper on um, K theory. Okay. Um, so um, uh, basically, I, um, what if, if you look at the generic uh, ring that summation x i y i equal to one. Mm -hmm. So in that it is equivalent. Okay. You look at um, um, Swan's paper, which precedes um, um, his uh, analysis paper on um, on K theory. Which year can we remember the uh, year? Uh, I mean, this is. Uh, let me see if I have my book. You know, I mean, can you look at Swan's paper, last paper in annals? Swan's last paper in annals. In hmm. that. Uh, he refers to the paper before that. Okay, he okay. wrote a paper okay. before that, and and you can find it. some J P May proceedings or something. Okay, more J P Moore, right? Moore, 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 J P Moore. That was his teacher, Swan's teacher. Yeah. So in that book, you will find that proof. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so this this works equivalence works in the case of. And, and y i equal to one in that thing. And Swan, Swan wrote it for us. Yeah, Swan he, wrote it for Mohan. I mean, he, he, he acknowledged it. Mohan and Madhav. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mohan, Mohan so in, was probably lazy in writing it down. <laughs> it is there That's in this joke. book, Mohan. Huh? JP Moore's. So, Hello? Yeah. It is there in that book, right? It is in that book. It is in that book. And if you have questions, you can write to me. Okay. Yeah. Another basic question is uh, it's very basic. It I'm maybe asking a triviality. Uh, we this Borontanski theorem, this is mu s of i is less than or equal to mu of i mod i square. But uh, yeah. is it equal for, this, uh, polynomial, for polynomial rings? For polynomial rings. But uh, uh, can we say that mu s of uh, oh okay, okay, I got it. I, am, I was uh, making a mistake. Mu s of i is always uh, i plus uh, one. Yeah. R plus one. Yeah. So okay, I was making a mistake. So whether it's less than or equal to, 
can it be actually strictly less than i mod i square mu of i mod i square yes in some cases yes. it can not this okay so very nice talk i could follow okay. most of the things oh thank you so thank you thank you for that thank you okay any any other questions from audience i don't see anything in the chat box okay thank uh, you everybody so, for the uh, uh, mohan you might not have noticed uh, uh. many of your own friends are in the audience maybe they want uh. to say hello to you kaushik is there yeah. and, uh,